God, as we turn to your word for us, may your Holy Spirit rest upon us. Help us to be faithful in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our li living. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'm a little sad this morning that as we come to the end of these stories of Peter that we've been telling in Scripture, right, we, we've come to the end of the narrative. He's been one of my favorite people to read about in Scripture. And as one, at one point or another, I imagine all of us can identify with him, right? And maybe in his successes, I seem to always identify more in his failures, but um, hopefully you have a better success rate right, with Peter. So I hope that uh, as we've been walking through his life of faith over these last weeks and months, it has been an encouragement to you and an inspiration as we have grown closer to God. And even though we don't have a scripture passage or a narrative of Peter's life this morning, we've moved into this next best thing, Peter's writings. So we begin this morning looking at the letter of First Peter. So the last time that I was here and preaching and we were looking at Peter's life, we were in Acts chapter 15. The last time that Peter shows up in a narrative, right, in the gospel writers. And the leadership of the early Christian church, they were meeting in Jerusalem and they were discussing what was to happen now with all these Gentile converts coming in into the faith of Jesus and how were all these different people groups going to work together? How, is, how are they going to get along? And did the people coming in, these, these Gentiles, and even sometimes the Samaritans, did they need to become full-fledged Jews for this community to really bond and be together? Did they need to follow the covenant of circumcision? Did they need to follow the Jewish food laws? Or was there going to be middle ground? And Peter, who was the symbolic gatekeeper for this budding new church, has been there to witness each group coming into the kingdom, the Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles. And he spoke up for this middle ground. And we read his last words in Acts, that God does not discriminate between people, that God purifies their hearts by faith, and therefore it's by the grace of God that we are saved. And just as they are no needing to become full-fledged Jews then and follow full Jewish law. These were amazing and powerful words at that time, and, and they helped influence and lead the council in their decision. And, and it helped establish some of the most basic tenets of our faith. It's hard to know if Paul influenced Peter or if Peter had some influence on Paul. If you read those, those letters, if you read some of the sermons, you're like, Peter's saw, sounding a little like Paul in there. And then sometimes in Paul's writing, you're like, hmm, that sounds a little bit like Peter. Because they both unequivocally make the case at one point or the other that following Jesus, in following Jesus, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ. But then, for Peter, it goes silent. For over a decade... We're not really sure what happens. The rest of the book of Acts will turn and focus to follow Paul and his experiences and his missionary journeys as the Spirit of God moves him, right, to, to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. But what happened to Peter? Where was he? We don't have his travel itinerary the way that we do for Paul, but there are some things that we know. We know that before this last moment in Acts 15, Peter had already begun traveling around and doing ministry. He was no longer centrally located in Jerusalem. And in fact, James, Jesus' brother, appears to have taken leadership of the church in Jerusalem. So Peter has fulfilled one of his main jobs, right, opening the doors of the kingdom of God for all, and now it seems that Peter is returning back to this traveling around and doing ministry out and about just like he was accustomed to when he was with Jesus. Knowing Peter as we have learned about him in the Gospels and in Acts, it seems unbelievable that he went silent all of a sudden. 
that is definitely not the Peter that we have met. Not his character, not his style. And in the beginning of First Peter, we, uh, we didn't read the two verses, and if we'd read them, we would have heard this letter that it's addressed to God's elect or God's chosen people, the exiles scattered throughout the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This letter is for these house churches that were meeting in these five Roman provinces. Today we know these provinces to be in the region of Turkey. And we know from Acts that Paul had some missionary journeys in that region too, starting churches. So it's not crazy to think that Peter too might have been out and about visiting in the same region doing ministry somewhere in a 10-year span that he might have visited there once, encouraging them, doing ministry. At one point in 1 Corinthians, Paul is discussing a problem that's going on in, new, in the church in the Cor- Corinth where he's uh, kind of yelling at them, if I'm being honest, uh, because the, the Christians in the church are arguing about which Christian leader they're going to follow, Right? Some say they're going to follow Peter, some say they're going to follow Apollo, and some uh, say they're going to follow Paul. Paul, Apollo, Peter, or any other Christian leader. It'd be like right now, um, some of you saying, well, I'm going to follow Pastor Ann, and then some of you saying, well, I'm going to follow Andy Stanley on the TV, right? um, I hope I got his name right. I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry if I didn't. Um, And then some of you saying, well, I'm going to follow Joel Olstein, or, and then some of you saying, well, I'm going to follow, like, it, you know, and Paul was calling it out saying, you don't follow leaders, you follow God. But the only way that the church could have known about Peter as a leader was probably if Peter had visited, right? He doesn't have a podcast at this time. There's no, you know, televangelist. And so it's not like the, P- the church in Corinth would have known who Peter was unless he had been also out and about doing ministry and traveling. So that's my best guess. I could be wrong, but that's my best guess. That's kind of what we're thinking, that he was out and about also. So we think Peter's been traveling around during this time and doing ministry, and we also know, though, that Peter has been in Rome. How long he was there, how many visits he had, we don't know exactly, but at a certain point, we all are solid that Peter went to Rome in the early mid-60s. And this would have been during the reign of the Emperor Nero during his reign. And I don't know if you have heard anything about Nero, but as emperors go, the Roman historians do not paint him as a very nice guy. He's not painted in a very flattering light. He was young when he came to power. Um, He was like 16 years old. And they kind of portray him then as this very young, naive, cruel, and reckless leader. He was corrupt and selfish. Um, He probably just wasn't old enough to be a leader also, right? (laughs) But like many emperors, uh, his family members were not always safe from his cruelty. And so Nero is said to have killed his mother, two of his wives, and multiple members of his family. But whether uh, fair or not, what is most tied to Nero is this really big fire that happened in Rome in uh, the year 64. So a fire broke out in a merchant quarter and it spread throughout the city of Rome. And it burned for six days. And after all was said and done, about 70% of the city of Rome, which had over a million people in it at that point, um, 70% of the city was burned and hundreds had died, thousands were homeless, and Roman historians blamed Nero for the fire, even suggesting that he started it himself because he wanted to rebuild the city with this grand vision that he had. Modern scholars today are a little less apt of blaming him for this fire, but any fire back then at this time, people were close by, 
structures were not super sturdy and they were flammable, and so any fire that started would have been really hard to contain. But the story of Nero playing his fiddle while Rome burns kind of became this popular myth, right? And Nero, he opened up his palace for people that had been affected by the fire. He offered assistance and help, but it wasn't enough to make people think he was a hero or that he didn't have anything to do with it. The city was restless, they were angry, and they were looking to Nero to blame. Nero, whether he was responsible or not for this, I have no clue, uh, needed to point the finger elsewhere. So <clears throat> when I think about this, uh, there's a Billy Joel song that comes to mind in the, from the 80s, right? We didn't start the fire, right? You know, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. You know this song, right? <laughs> yes. So. Basically, Billy Joel is saying in the song, hey, don't blame our generation. All the junk that's going on, all the scandal, the, you know, the tragedies, it didn't start with our generation, right? They, it began way before us, and so we're not responsible. Don't blame us. I think Nero was trying to be the originator of that song, right? I didn't start the fire, right? It was already burning before I ever knew about it. I didn't start the fire, but I'm going to tell you who to blame. And that's what Nero did. An easy target at this time was the new Christian community that was spreading in Rome right now, and they were a problem. For some in Rome, Christians were becoming suspicious and a bit of a problem. They had rejected Roman gods, and their beliefs started to pull them out of alignment with Rome. And they followed a rule who, ruler who they said was their savior and who they said was dead and raised from the dead, right? A, a dead Messiah. And so for Nero, they became his scapegoats. And he was quite, quite cruel in how he punished them. The Roman historians Tacitus uh, recorded what happened. And I'm not going to go into everything um, because it's really awful. Um, but he did cover them in animal clothing and let them be attacked by other animals, and they were killed that way. Like, that's the mild thing that he did to Christians at this point. Um, and then many were crucified. So it was commonly understood that during this time, Peter was in Rome, and he was one of the early Christians who was rounded up and killed because of Nero sometime after this fire. And so we, we record Peter's death in the year of 64, sometime after that July fire. But because of this timeline, scholars have Peter writing this first letter somewhere between 62 and 64 in Rome. He's been in Rome, he wrote the letter, and then this great persecution uh, comes. So Peter, we know, had help in writing this letter. It says Silas helped him. And the letter has a very Greco-Roman kind of flow to it. We notice a very similar flow to Paul when he writes his letters too. They are a product of their culture and their environment. They first begin with a greeting. Peter's greeting has some very big Old Testament overtones to it. He says he's writing to the chosen people of God elected and strangers, or people in exile. And this reminds us of Abraham's family, who God first chose to be his people and called to move to a new land as strangers in the book of Genesis. So everyone that Peter is writing to is both, he's saying, Jews and Gentiles alike, you're all being invited into that very first story of God choosing his people, right? And now you are going to be the continuation of God's chosen people. They're being reminded that as believers in Jesus, they live with a different understanding than those in the culture and the society around them, that they're to be obedient and faithful because Christ's sacrifice on the cross made them this new people, chosen people, but also 
strangers and exiles within the community around them. They're different. For two verses, that is a very heavy intro filled with calling and invitation to be faithful to Jesus. But what comes next in the letter uh, written during this time is then praise and thanksgiving to God. For Rome, it was to a God, whatever local deity they are writing to. But in our passage, clearly, it is praise and thanksgiving to God, the creator of the universe, the father of Jesus Christ, the one and only God. It's what we call a doxology, a prayer of praise. And we often use these in worship. We even sing them. One of the most common ones in the church is always in the past usually used after offering time. Uh, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. That is a doxology, right? It's a prayer of praise to our God, our Father. And so that is what Peter's writing here. Reverend Dr. Dennis Edwards, he's the dean of North Park Seminary. He's written a commentary on 1 Peter. He was here a year, a year ago. Um, but he's written a commentary, and I will use it heavily as we're walking through this. But when he's writing on this section, he wrote that good theology gives rise to doxology. Good theology gives rise to doxology. And I like that. When you have a good understanding of who God is and what God has done, it's easy to whip out the pen then and write out a doxology of prayer and praise to God. Peter knew exactly who God was and what God had done. And so he wrote this poem, this psalm of praise. So we're not going to dwell long on it uh, because this is the intro that kind of sets up the whole letter. And each of these themes is going to be revisited. But I did want to point out a flow of this doxology or flow of this good theology. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. This is basically the beginning beginning of Peter's understanding of salvation, right? The new believers are born anew into this new family of God, solely through God's mercy. This new birth, it's, it's only possible because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And this, then, is one of the basic tenets of the Christian church, right? That we are born anew into a new family of God solely because of God's mercy with Christ's death and resurrection. But what I love is that Peter rejoices over what this new birth gives us. And he writes about it. This new birth, it gives us three things. He says this new birth, it brings us a living hope. The hope that we have is in, as Christians, it's not dead or it's not a delusion. It's not just wishful thinking. It's, it's not, boy, do I think that's true or I hope that's true. It's not crossing our fingers. It's real. It's alive. It's full of God's promises. It's also not just a, a thing or it's not just words. This t- hope this living hope is very much a person. This living hope is not just about, uh, this living hope is not just given to us through the resurrection of Jesus. This living hope is Jesus. Of course, Peter would begin there. He experienced the loss of Jesus on the cross firsthand. And then he experienced the shocking and joyous resurrection of Jesus. He experienced being forgiven by Jesus and then called to lead this new church. It wasn't theoretical, it wasn't delusion. Hope spoke to him. Hope was able to be touched and seen. Hope breathed on him and hope loved him. 
This is the living hope that all believers have received. And Peter's praise, it just begins there. He says it begins with this living hope in Jesus Christ, but it doesn't end there. The second thing that he talks about what this new birth gives believers is it brings us into an inheritance. So I always, uh, when I go out of town, I have a habit of unfortunately forgetting to look at my fridge before I go out of town. I don't clean it out. And then when I come back, I have some very disgusting surprises for me when I get back. Anyone else? I see people looking at each other, so I'm going to say that as a yes, right? In this world, we are very well aware that things do not last forever, right? The uh, uh, fruit that's in your fridge when you come back is now moldy and disgusting. Um, but uh, your computers break down. They, they are you know, not made to last forever. Our wash mach machines break. Um, technology always changes. It's never meant to last forever. Money gets used. It doesn't last forever. But what more, we know that our relationships, they don't last forever sometimes, right? Jobs don't last forever. Health doesn't last forever. People don't last forever. Peter says none of this lasts forever, right? Well, Peter says, except one thing. One thing lasts forever, our inheritance. Our inheritance with God, right? Our inheritance as children of God. New birth gives us this inheritance that cannot be destroyed. It's the kingdom of God. God is keeping all that he's doing. His restoring, his redeeming of his creation. He's doing this and he's keeping it safe until the day when all things are going to be made new. Not only is he keeping his kingdom safe, he's keeping those that believe in him safe for his kingdom, transforming us, renewing us, and holding us tightly until his reign is total and complete. But Peter also mentions something here that we don't like to hear a lot, that some of us, that some of this holding tightly and some of this inheritance and some of this uh, new birth is experienced through suffering. But it's that in suffering we are refined and not destroyed. It's in this suffering that we learn what is truly important and what is not. And it's often in our suffering that we become examples and inspiration for those around us to turn to God. Though none of us would willingly want to suffer, Peter wants us to remember that it's in suffering that we often can grow and reveal the true glory of God to the world. As we grow in faithfulness, as we grow in faithfulness in our suffering, we remember and we point to God's ultimate faithfulness through his suffering on the cross. But there's a third thing that Peter says this new birth brings us, and it's salvation for our souls. Our faith and the inheritance that we receive is ultimately about the salvation of our souls. Peter is praising God for the promised day when God will deliver his people from the brokenness and pain and suffering and oppression of this earth. That everything that we know that is wrong and unjust will be made right. That everything that is evil and painful, it will be ended. This is the good news of our God being a just judge. This is the, this is the good news of Christ coming again. And this is what we and the world are waiting for. These are just Peter's beginning words, his psalm of praise to God, his intro to this letter. And, and we're going to continue in this letter, and as we continue with the letter, we'll bring these, these themes with us, this living hope, this inheritance. 
we're going to talk a little more about suffering and then salvation. We're bringing them with us. And as we read and as we learn and as we grow, I hope that we are able then to join with Peter in his song of praise for his ever-living hope, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Holy God, living God, we thank you that you truly are our living hope, that you are one that we can trust, one that is alive, one that is active in this world and fulfilling your promises. Lord, we thank you for who you are and that you have called us to be your children and in that you lay before us our inheritance, your kingdom of God. Thank you for keeping it safe for us and thank you for keeping us safe. Lord, we pray not only for our salvation, but for the salvation of those that do not know you yet. Use us, Lord, to be lights and beacons drawing people to you so that they know that there is true hope in this world, that they know that they are loved, that they are wanted, and, Lord, that there is a Savior. So, Lord, now receive the offering of our lives, our time, and our labor, and feed us with your grace. We pray this along with the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.